Welcome, is surgery friends. At last, the endoscopic surgical anatomy of the middle ear, a talk that I probably should have given around 10 years ago. It's really a talk designed for not just medical students, residents and registrars, but also established surgeons that have a good understanding of the middle ear anatomy and want to explore the endoscopic view, that is putting your eyes inside the ear so that you can really contextualize the anatomy very well. I really wanted to start by thanking Professor Daniele Marchioni. A lot of you know who he is, and Daniele is obviously a gifted musician, also a gifted surgeon, and a gifted artist. And uh, those of you who may not know, but he has two textbooks on endoscopic ear surgery, and he's hand-drawn all of the images in his textbook, aside from the photographs, and I take a lot of these images, with his permission, to use in this talk. So really, we wanted to assume a level of anatomy here before I uh, walk you through the middle ear and understand the different subunits of the middle ear. So for those of you coming from the microscopic era, we understand the mesotympanum. Now the mesotympanum is that area of the middle ear where the tympanic membrane is projected onto the middle ear, onto the medial wall of the middle ear. Now I want you to drop your eyes inside the middle ear and pretend in this right ear to be looking towards the right hand side of the anterior view and we will be talking about the protympanum first and then I'll move on to talking about ventilation because air comes from the protympanum into the middle ear and we'll talk about areas that are applicable to us, Prusak space and the epitympanum and then I'll move on to talk about the epitympanum which is the roof of the ear then if you imagine looking posteriorly, so behind the tympanic membrane and then looking posteriorly in this right ear, we'll talk about the retrotympanum. And I'll try and tie everything together for you with our friend, the facial nerve, so you understand and can contextualize the facial nerve from the endoscopic perspective. And we'll finish with a couple of operative approaches and understanding the surgical anatomy of these, and that's the infracochlear approach and the transpromatorial approach, which are both very excellent for you to tie together all of the anatomy that you learn throughout this talk. It's quite a long talk, I warn you, it's over an hour, um, but those of you who can bear it, hopefully you'll get a little bit from this talk. So beginning with the protympanum, so this is the right ear, and imagine if you're dropping yourself into the right ear and then looking towards the front of the ear. So this is lovely diagrams from Daniele put into an article that we published in other uh, clinics of North America. And we can see from superior to inferior the various structures. So the tensor tympani fold subdivides the protympanum from the anterior epitympanum. And below that we have the supratubal recess. Then we have the tensor tympani canal with the cochleariform process. A new area that we named in this paper, the subtensor recess, that area that's medial. And then we have the protympanic spine running along the floor of the protympanum. And then another new structure, inferiorly, that subdivides the protympanum from the hypotympanum. This is called the protoniculum. From posterior to anterior in this right ear, we can see Jacobson's nerve, or variably the carotico-cochlear recess that borders the posterior boundary of the protympanum. And then we have the protympanic spine along the floor and the eustachian tube seen anteriorly. So these are some endoscopic views of the right ear. And you can see these same structures, the supratubal recess. So this is superior on the left, inferior on the right here, looking anteriorly. The tensor tympani canal, the su subtensor recess, the protympanic spine running along here, the corticococlear recess along here. We can see the carotid artery in the floor of the protympanum and then the protoniculum subdividing the protympanum from the hypotympanum. And we can see anterolaterally here the opening to the eustachian tube marked with the asterisk. Now the protoniculum, if we look at this in more detail, this follows the pattern of many structures in the middle ear. Many of the structures in the middle ear have a conformation of a ridge, a bridge, or an absent configuration. And we can see a type A ridge drawn here. This is a right ear cartoon. We can see the endoscopic view just here with a ridge, and then we can see a bridge just here where air and pneumatization can occur underneath the protoniculum, and then an absent protoniculum, all seen in the right ear. If we look at the subtensor space, this is described according to its pneumatization patterns superiorly. So here now, we're looking in the left ear. And so we can see superior is to the right and inferior to the left with the protoniculum here and the tensor tympani muscle. And you can see pneumatization extending not under the tensor, just under the tensor, and then superior to the tensor muscle, giving us the subtensor space. 
Now let's talk about ventilation. And this is very relevant because we think that obstruction of ventilation pathways may be one of the causations of initiation of inflammation and potentially cholesteatoma. And we can see Prusak's space here. Now this is a space that occurs in the superior part of the tympanic membrane, lateral to the epitympanum, and it's ventilated between the posterior malleolar ligament and the posterior malleolar fold, and we can see the ventilation pathways drawn here. The floor of Prusak's space is formed bonally by the neck of the malleus, and then we can see the malleolar incadial fold and the anterior malleolar fold forming the antero-inferior aspect of Prusak's space. And in this lovely image from Daniela's book, we can see actually in a patient, we can see when they're valsalvering or popping their ears, how this new uh, Prusak space actually opens up and ventilates through this fold. Now let's move to our Sydney endoscopic lab dissection videos and we can see in this left ear using a round knife we're lifting up the annulus and you'll soon be able to see the posterior, oh, this is the same diagram that Daniela has drawn before in his textbook showing the posterior uh, tympanic spine and we can see the spine just here, the posterior spine with the posterior malleolar ligament and as we lift up, we can start to see the floor of Prusak space here with the short process of malleus just here and the neck of malleus seen where I'm uh, using the arrow to, to demonstrate the neck of the malleus. We can see often a dehiscence in the anterior floor with communication into the anterior epitympanum and the anterior malleolar ligament forming part of the floor of the anterior aspect of Prusak space. And here a rosin needle palpating the anterior malleolar ligament. Now let's look at ventilation of the epitympanic space. And as I mentioned to you, one of the well-known theories of cholesteatoma formation is obstruction of the isthmus and potentially selective disventilation of the epitympanic and mastoid air cell systems. So I like to think of this as a primary ventilation pathway, a secondary ventilation pathway, and a tertiary or accessory ventilation pathway. The primary ventilation pathway in this right ear cartoon, we can see the anterior crus of the stapes and the tensor tympani muscle. And the primary ventilation comes from the protympanum in this right ear, medial to the malleus, and in between the tensor and the anterior border of the crus. This is the primary ventilation pathway. If there's obstruction here, this is often where we'll get negative, ventil uh, negative pressures developing in the epitympanum and in the mastoid. The secondary ventilation pathway occurs in the po behind the posterior crus of the stapes and medial to the body of the incus. And the tertiary or accessory ventilation pathways occur through the tensor fold. And we'll talk about the tensor fold coming up in a few slides from now. But the tensor fold can be complete or it can have an opening. So it can be incomplete. And if it's incomplete, it provides ventilation through the anterior epitympanic space into the epitympanic space and then into the antrum and mastoid. So once again, left ear, switching between left and right ear, lab dissection, we can see the protympanum here, the mesotympanum with the projection of the middle ear, and the epitympanum with the hypotympanum just here. And what I'll do is I'll fast forward this a little bit because we've run through these slides, but we can see from superior this view here, and we can see how we have the tensor fold here, the anterior malleolar ligament, the malleolar fold and incadial malleolar fold, and we can see a lovely demonstration of ventilation through Prusak space and then through the primary isthmus between the cochleariform process and the anterior crus of the stapes. Now look at this in the cadaver, left ear, tensor tympani tendon, primary ventilation between the anterior crus of the stapes and the tensor tympani. We can see primary ventilation into Prusak space between the posterior malleolar lig ligament and the fold into Prusak space. And then if we have a, in, a complete tensor fold, no ventilation through the accessory pathway, and if it's an incomplete tensor fold, you can see how we have ventilation going through, through the tensor fold up into the anterior epitympanum. If we remove the ossicles, you can see everything all together. Primary ventilation pathway, secondary ventilation pathway, posterior across of stapes and medial to the incus with the accessory ventilation pathway through the tensor fold. So surgically, that's quite relevant for you to understand if we're thinking about functional ear surgery. Now look at, let's look at some applied protympanic anatomy with ventilation. This is an open type congenital cholesteatoma. 
patient right ear, 11 year old child, and we're removing the cholesteatoma off the promontory. And you can see ultimately some disease over the protoniculum and in the region of the subtensor recess. This is a 30 degree scope in the right ear. And then when we pass it further on, we can actually see the eustachian tube in the anterolateral aspect of the protympanum in a live patient with the carotid artery anteroinferiorly and a type B subtensor recess in this patient. So applied protympanic anatomy. It's important for you to understand this anatomy because you may get disease in this region. So this idea of selective disventilation theory was popularized more once again with Professor Marchioni, 2010-2011 research papers and these pictures are from his textbook in 2016. And we can see now in these cartoons where we have uh, images of the left ear now, where we have ventilation through the primary pathway, tensor fold, anterior cross of stapes, and if there's obstruction and debris in this region, then we can get negative pressure developing in this region and retraction of the tympanic membrane, one of the ways in which cholesteatoma may form. Let's talk about the chorda tympani next, because when you're lifting the tympanic membrane up, the chorda tympani is one of those structures that you can potentially injure. And this is some lovely work from uh, Dr. Uranica from Kobe University. And the point here is just like in all biology, there's a normative distribution of the way the chorda tympani presents itself in the middle ear. And I wanted to highlight this slide for you, really to, for you to understand this one to three percent of patients where you can potentially cut the chorda tympani when you're lifting up a tympanomiatal flap. And then there's an, another 5% or so of patients have an ultra short type of chorda, which may be of relevance when you're doing explorations around the incudostopedial joint and you don't necessarily come across the chorda tympani at all when you're doing this type of surgery. So important to recognize that, but realize that most of your patients will be with this attached long, detached, or attached short type of chorda tympani. Now if we look at these lovely images from uh, Lucas's group in Bern, we can see endoscopic anat anatomy dissection of this with the posterior entrance, the posterior canaliculus of the chorda. This is a left ear traversing lateral to the long process of the incus and medial to the neck of the malleus. And we can see after dividing the neck of the malleus how the chorda tympani is going superior to the tensor tendon and the cochleariform process and it exits the anterior canaliculus with the anterior malleolar ligament as well as the anterior tympanic artery. These three structures are going through the petrotympanic fissure. Very useful for you to understand and know. Now I mentioned to you that we talk about tensile fold variations and this is important to divide, the, understand the subdivision between the protympanum and the epitympanum. The tensile fold it presents in three relative conformations, horizontal, oblique or vertical and this subtends a different space so inferiorly is the supratubal recess and superior to this is the anterior epitymp epitympanum so you can see when we have a horizontal tensile fold there's a relatively small supratubal recess and when we have a vertical tensile fold there's a very large supratubal recess important for you to understand as well as the fact that there can be complete or incomplete tensile folds where we actually have a hole in them so again, putting this all together in a right ear, right ear cartoon, we can form the epitympanic diaphragm, understanding that the bulk of the diaphragm is formed by the, the head of the malleus and the body of the incus, which is why if we remove the incus, we can really allow better ventilation into the mastoid. Laterally, we have the malleolar and incodal malleolar fold and the anterior malleolar fold with the anterior malleolar ligament. The tensor fold is medial to this, antro, uh, antromedial to this, and we can see the primary isthmus as I mentioned to you before, the secondary isthmus which is posterior to the stapes, and then we can have an accessory isthmus, uh, accessory ventilation through an incomplete tensor fold. One interesting paper I found when reviewing and researching for this talk was a, a micro CT paper which I didn't really know about before, which was about discussing the anterior malleolar ligament. And the point of this paper, even though it's a small sample size, is just to demonstrate to you that this ligament is actually quite thick. It extends from the whole neck of the malleus to the anterior malleolar spine. And you can see in these micro CTs that it's quite a thick ligament extending into the petrotympanic fissure. So once again, demonstrating that. Let's move back to the lab now. This is the left ear with an atacotomy, epitympanum, and you can see these lovely diagrams. And what we're going to be doing is removing the lateral wall of the epitympanum or the atacotomy. 
to demonstrate the head of the malleus and the incus. So we use the curette in the lab. We often use underwater drilling now. And we can see the caudal eminence, the posterior canaliculus with the cauda lateral to the incus, medial to the neck of the malleus, and superior to the tensor fold with the anterior malar ligament. So this is a left ear. So just flipping your head around between the right and left, we can see the body of the incus and the incutomalleolar joint here, and the head of the malleus just here with the neck just here. Now using a malleus head nipper to divide the neck, and then we can really see the quarter extending and, and also dividing the tensile tendon to take out the long process of the malleus. And then we can sort of see the quarter extending out and exiting superiorly and anteriorly. If we, I included the extended attic dissection here from our Sydney Endoscopic Ear Surgery Manual, and we can see the tensile fold here with the malleus head. It's an extension of the previous dissection with the incus body and demonstrating the re relative relationships with the short process just here. The facial nerve can be seen medial to the long process of the incus and superior to the stapes. Remember, this is a right ear. Now let's move our eyes from the epitympanum looking superiorly in the attic towards the posterior part of the middle ear or the retrotympanum, a very important surgical anatomy area, an area that has a high rate along with the anterior epitympanum of residual cholesteatoma, that is cholesteatoma left behind by the surgeon. And the way for you to systematize and understand the retrotympanum is to subdivide it into a superior retrotympanum and an inferior retrotympanum. And this is done by the subiculum, which travels from the posterior pillar of the round window to the styloid eminence, which is the posterior part of the middle ear. We'll talk about the round window in more detail, but the subiculum then subtends superiorly the retrotympanum and inferior, sorry, the superior retrotympanum and inferiorly the inferior retrotympanum. And note the inferior retrotympanum, which is bordered by the funiculus and the subiculum, between the funiculus and the protoniculum is the hypotympanum of, rele of relevance for the infracochlear approach. So now let's move on and talk about the superior retrotympanum. Here are some lovely diagrams from Daniela talking about the ponticulus, and we teach our registrars and residents how to remember this with the three Ps. So we talk about the promontory, the pyramid, and the structure between the two forming the ponticulus, Latin for bridge. And we can see the bridge conformation demonstrated with this hook here, the bridge conformation and the absent conformation. If we're looking at pneumatization patterns in the superior retrotympanum, another important space is medial to the pyramid. And this is called the subpyramidal space here. And we can see lovely diagrams of the subpyramidal space and how it can communicate with the posterior sinus. The posterior sinus is that, is that space that's medial to the stapedius tendon. And also, if, if this was uh, the stapedius tendon and this is the posterior crus of the stapes, we can see that it's medial, uh, posterior to the crus of the stapes and medial to the stapedius tendon, forming the posterior sinus. The sinus tympani is very important. It's a very important area which can often be missed in terms of cholesteatoma resection. And it's subtended between the ponticulus and the subiculum. And we usually describe its pneumatization pattern relative to the facial nerve. So again, lovely diagrams from Daniele, with type A being anterior to the border of the facial nerve, type B being medial to the um, axial section here of the facial nerve. And type C is important because it can extend quite deeply posterior to the border of the facial nerve. And this may require, it may not be accessible endoscopically, and may require a mastoidectomy and a um, uh, to reach the medial aspect of the facial nerve and the sinus tympani in this uh, approach. Now let's look at the inferior retrotympanum. The inferior retrotympanum is that area subtended between the subiculum, which is just here, and the funiculus just here. The funiculus runs from the anterior pillars, remember posterior pillar of the round window niche, anterior pillar of the round window niche. It's extending from the anterior pillar down towards the jugular bulb. All of this area of the inferior retrotympanum, very important for round window surgery, very important for the cochlear implant surgeon. So the funiculus just demonstrated here. Now let's look at the round window region. If we're looking at the medial wall, the important structures here is the fustus, which is a very important structure, even for those of you who don't do endoscopic ear surgery, but those of you that are doing a lot of 
cochlear implant surgery, it guides us either to the inferior border of the round window or to the round window itself. The area medial to that is called, or superior and inferior to the fustus on the medial wall of the round window region, is called the area concomerata. And this is another area when we drill through the fustus can allow us to reach the petrous apex. Here's some lovely work from uh, a colleague of ours, Manahar Bance in Cambridge in his lab. You look at the micro CT of the round window, and I really wanted to include this as a recent paper, just because it's important for us to understand as round window surgeons, cochlear implant surgeons, this structure called the Christa Fenestra. And you can see here its application to atraumatic cochlear implantation insertion. And these micro CT sagittal views, you can see the varying heights of the Christa Fenestra. And seeing this in the inferior border of the round window may be important to drill that out so that you can get a more direct trajectory to the basal turn. Very important for the um, for certain cochlear implants that require an application device that is straight into the basal turn. So removing the Christofenestra may be important in these type of cochleostomies. The fustus variations are important because the fustus is really an important landmark when we have very difficult round window anatomy. And this would classically be in the scenario, of, for example, far advanced otosclerosis or meningitis or meningitic uh, patients where we're doing cochlear implantation or the syndromic child where we have abnormal anatomy and we're doing a cochlear implantation you obviously wouldn't necessarily use the endoscope for this. We would still be doing a posterior tympanotomy. But you may insert a 1.9 arthroscope into their 30 degree and inspect the anatomy so that you can then proceed with confidence with your microscopic anatomy. And the Fusters here has two confirmations. Again, some work um, uh, done with Professor Marchioni and my friend Nicholas Jufus. And we can see here the fustus points either inferior to the round window on the type B conformation, which seems, tends to be the more common conformation, or it points straight to the round window. That's very important for you to remember. So it is a very important guideline for finding the round window when there's difficult anatomy. The subcochlear canaliculus is that area that's in between the fustus and the funiculus. So if you recall, the funiculus and the protoniculum subtend the hypotympanum. The funiculus is the inferior border of the inferior retrotympanum. Between the fustus and the funiculus is the subcochlear canaliculus. And it has three pneumatization conformations. In reverse, type A is more pneumatized with type C not being as pneumatized. Again, very important for you to understand if you're performing the infracochlear approach. And those of you that do pediatrics, often in the very pneumatized child with aggressive cholesteatoma, it can frequently be disease extending into the infracochlear region. And understanding the subcochlear canaliculus can be important for making sure that you don't have residual disease there. And this is also important in patients with that phenotype of cholesteatoma called petrous bone cholesteatoma, a different phenotype of cholesteatoma. So now let's move back into the lab, a left ear dissection, back in the lab from the research group's dissection manual. And let's have a look at this. So we've been through these structures already. Left ear now, we can see the incudostopedial joint, the ponticulus in its bridge conformation. The subiculum down here, and we can see the bridge conformation demonstrated with an arrow. The subiculum down here, and we can see the sinus tympani subtended between the ponticulus and the subiculum. A very nice demonstration of that. The posterior sinus, medial to the stapedius and posterior to the posterior border of the stapes, with the subpraminal space medial to this region just here. So a nice demonstration in the lab of these structures in a left ear. Now we remove some of the round window niche, and we can see the fustus just here pointing to inferior to the round, round window. So this is a type B conformation of the fustus. And then the subcochlear canaliculus between the funiculus and the fustus, here and probably a type A, uh, type BC conformation. And then between the protoniculum and the funiculus is the hypotympanum in this left ear. So let's move on to some applied retrotympanic anatomy. And this is a patient, a right ear, presented with recurring ear infections and a retraction with a mild conductive hearing loss. On the ipsilateral view, we can see the incudostopedial joint. And now I move to the contralateral side of the patient. And so the incudostopedial joint is to the right with the quarter just here. And I've moved on to the opposite side of the patient with a 30-degree scope. And I'm removing the disease off the posterior cruis 
between the ponticulus and the subiculum down here. So this is the sinus tympani in this region. And then inferior to the subiculum is the sinus subtympanicus just here. The equivalent of the sinus tympani, but in the inferior retrotympanum. A nice view of applied retrotympanic anatomy. Very important for, you, for those of you that do clostridium surgery to understand this because it is a common site of residual disease. I wanted to include this paper that we just published a year or two ago about the stapedius muscle. And most of the time the stapedius muscle is in this conformation of medial to the descending portion of the facial nerve about 90% of the time. 10% of the time it can be anterior or lateral to the facial nerve. But the point of this paper is that we can remove the stapedius in aggressive disease and potentially extend the dissection pathway of the lateral wall of the sinus tympani or the sinus subtympanicus. So Danielle has done these lovely drawings from our paper that we published showing the extension of this and then Alicia Rubini should be credited fully for this paper. She did a lot of these dissections in our lab here in Sydney and we can see the stapedius muscle in situ here and then removed. It's not the best demonstration but you can get the idea that if we remove this bone that's on the floor of the stapedius canal how we can extend the view of the sinus tympani in retrotympanic dissection. So this is a very good way of demonstrating how we can extend the sinus tympani dissection. Now let's put a lot of this together with the facial nerve. The facial nerve, as you all know, for those of you that do ear surgery, is our friend. We, of course, need to know where it is at all times so that we don't injure the facial nerve. And in this lovely left ear cartoon, Daniela subdivides this into pre-cochleariform and post-cochleariform facial nerve. The first area I wanted to highlight is this area called the supraginiculate area. And in this left ear cartoon, we can see the supraginiculate area being above the geniculate ganglion, bordered superiorly by the middle cranial fossa, inferiorly by the facial nerve and the geniculate ganglion, and posteriorly the antrum and the lateral semicircular canal. And it's an extension into the petrous apex. So you can see this dissection. I'm doing an underwater dissection. This was done in Singapore just a couple of weeks ago. And we can see this left ear with the stapes just here, the round window down here, the ponticulus just here. We can see the facial nerve along here with the geniculate ganglion in this region and the lateral semicircular canal with the antrum. And you can see I'm using an underwater drill technique to demonstrate the middle fossa just here, which we've drilled away, and drilling down into the supraginiculate area just here. So now let's look at the lab dissection of this from our endoscopic ear surgery group, the lab dissection, left ear, facial nerve, putting it all together for you. And if you can have a look here, we start with the Jacobson's nerve. This is a good way to start and understand the orientation of the facial nerve. So the tympanic plexus, the funiculus has an intimate relationship to Jacobson's nerve, which uh, is a subdivision of the ninth or the glossopharyngeal cranial nerve. And it's related to the funiculus about 85% of the time, extending over the promontory, corticotympanic nerves can come off there. And then we remove and dislocate and remove the tensile tympani muscle out of its canal and then we can see when we do that Jacobson's nerve becoming less a superficial petrosal in the medial wall of the tensile tympani canal. So you have to lift the tensile tympani muscle up and out and then the geniculate ganglion is superior to this and we can have the two nerves, this lesser and the greater superficial petrosal traveling along the middle fossa floor in this left ear in parallel. And those of you that come with a middle fossa approach would understand this. But you can see putting it all together in the left ear, tympanic segment of the facial nerve, the stapes just here and the geniculate ganglion just here. This is the supraginiculate region that I showed to you before. The infrapromontorial approach now I wanted to just discuss with you because it's an important anatomy to understand for those of us doing infracochlear approach, for example, for cholesterol granuloma or again pediatric or adult cholesteratoma that's extending into this region. And the important landmark here is the fustus, which forms the superior boundary of your infracochlear approach superiorly, anteroinferiorly the internal carotid artery, and posteroinferiorly the jugular bulb. So if we have a look in the lab, this is the left ear lab dissection. Once again, round window, fustus just here, funiculus here, Jacobson's nerve traveling, traveling along here, using a curette to remove the funiculus just here. The jugular bulb will be in this region, the carotid artery anteriorly, and we can see the exposed jugular bulb. We're extending into the infracochlear approach just here through the petrous apex.
using a curette, but this was done many years ago now. Now we do underwater drilling. And you can see now when we're looking from above, we have anteroinferiorly the carotid artery, posteroinferiorly the jugular bulb, and the infracochlear axis underneath with the fustus forming the superior boundary of that. So we can see the final dissection colorized with the carotid artery anteroinferiorly, the jugular bulb posteroinferiorly, and the infracochlear approach just here. So now let me put this together for you with an infracochlear applied anatomy. This is a patient who presented with severe headache and pressure in their head on the left-hand side. The infracochlear approach to a cholesterol granuloma demonstrated on axial T1 and T2 weighted images to be bright, but characteristic of cholesterol granuloma. And you can see on the coronal images, very amenable to an infracochlear approach just here. So this is a patient left ear with a headache and once again talking to you about the applied anatomy of the infracochlear approach with the fustus being the superior border here the fustus being the superior border of the infracochlear anatomy approach internal carotid artery in this left ear anteroinferior and jugular bulb posteroinferior now let's move into the operating room left ear tympanomiatal flap quarter tympani grade three annulus just here middle ear incudostopedial joint the fustus just here excuse me, and the infracochlear approach just around here with the subcochlear canaliculus between the funiculus and the fustus. So now using underwater drilling with a three diamond, underwater drilling to do a canal plasty posteroinferiorly, and then I'll move to a two diamond, making sure I identify as much of the carotid artery and the jugular bulb as I can, as well as maintaining that superior border of the fustus to preserve the function of the cochlea. I then use uh, the drill at low speed around the superior dissection region here as we're getting to the cochlear and then the curette as well as cup forceps to remove bone to demonstrate the posterior aspect of this cholesterol granuloma and then using a sharp beaver blade to puncture this area and then widen the region so you can see that classic cholesterol granuloma that we can see puncturing this area that motor oil fuel they talk about with the little crystals in it and then I use an underwater drill two millimeter drill to widen this to make it a maximum diameter drainage area and then put a silastic inside there a thin conical silastic 0.13 millimeter uh, stent to allow us to drain that into the middle into the nose via the pro tympanum and then you can actually put the three millimeter endoscope into the cholesterol granuloma itself and we can see some of the relational anatomy we can actually see the dura here of the brain stem inside the cholesterol granuloma so quite a nice demonstration of applied anatomy of the infracochlear approach in this sort of video that we can see here the hook region is very important for us to understand those of us that do cochlear implant surgery it's a very interesting area to understand because we can then really understand the relational and three-dimensional anatomy of the basal turn of the cochlea. So this is lovely work from um, uh, from Lucas's paper once again demonstrating uh, Dr. Unschut's paper as well as uh, some of our work and in this left ear you can see the spherical recess and the elliptical recess forming the medial wall of the vestibule and we can see scala vestibuli coming off the vestibule and scala tympani coming from the middle ear the tympanum or the middle ear the scala tympani formed here this is the bone that we remove after we take out the stapes and we remove the bone between the round window and the over window when you remove the lateral surface of that then you'll understand why it's called the hook region and this is the spiral lamina that we can see just forming here forming and separating scala tympani from scala vestibuli and you can see the crista fenestra just outlined here this is the fenestra that we drill out this is professor Bance's group and we drill out this to get a more tangential or direct view into the basal turn of the cochlear for cochlear implantation and again in the singapore dissection lab when we were doing them underwater just a few uh, weeks ago we can see the underwater dissection here where i'm drilling in between the oval window and the round window just here this is the round window, this is the over window, removing that bone and we can see the spiral lamina in a live view just here with scala tympani coming from the middle ear and scala vestibuli coming from the tympanum. So the hook region, quite important to understand.
Now we're extending our understanding into the lateral internal auditory canal, just so that you can understand what's beyond the middle ear. Always good for us surgeons to understand what goes beyond what we're dissecting, so it gives us a lot of confidence and comfort in what we're doing. So we can see some cartoons here of the left ear in the outpatient view. Daniela has the outpatient view and then in the surgical view just here. And we can see in this left ear we've taken out the stapes foot plate. You can see the facial canal here. You can see the ampulated end of the lateral and superior semicircular canals, but the saccule sitting in the spherical, sorry, in the elliptical recess, uh, sorry, in the spherical recess, and in the elliptical recess is the utricle. So we can see just here. And this is from Lucas's paper again, beautifully describing the topo topographical anatomy of the medial labyrinthine wall. And the point of this paper that I really wanted to highlight to you, those of you that get into the lab again, is this cochlear vestibular bone between the vestibule and the cochlea. So we remove the bone off the lateral aspect between the, after we take the stapes out, and that bone between the oval and round window reveals the hook region. And then when we've drilled through that, we next reach the medial border, the, the cochlear vestibular bone. So we've taken this bone off between the oval window and the round window, reveals the hook region. And then the bone below that is called the cochlear vestibular bone. And when we drill that, you can see again in the Singapore lab, I'm drilling between, this is the left ear, the vestibule and the round window just here. You'll see I'll open up this cochlear vestibular bone and that allows me to stay away from the facial nerve when I enter into the lateral internal auditory canal. That's why that bone is so important for us to understand if we're extending the drilling into the lateral internal auditory canal because we want to stay away from the facial nerve of course. And so then if you drill this very carefully in the lab you can eventually see the cochlear nerve very beautifully will usually go through the inferior and superior vestibular nerve when we're doing this. So now let's put it together again in the lab. Left ear, transpromatorial dissection. You can see the facial nerve just here and the stapes. We're taking out the stapes and then we remove this bone between the oval window and the cochlea. So as I demonstrated to you, the bone between the oval window and the round window, we remove that. That's what the curate's doing here and we're looking for the hook region after that. That'll be the first structure that we're looking for. You, and we can see the hook region here with the spiral ligament and the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli coming in from the vestibule. The spherical recess just here for the saccule, the utricle sitting in the elliptical recess, and then with a 30 degree scope, we can actually see the ampulated end of the posterior semicircular canal in here. The mid turn of the cochlea here, where we can see again the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli, this is all from our dissection manual online, Sydney Endoscopic Ear Group, with the osseous spiral lamina and the modiolus, with the helica tremor seen in the top part of the screen. This is removing the cochleovestibular bone. And we can see a lovely demonstration here of the cochlear nerve and the facial nerve in its labyrinthine segment here, with inferior and superior vestibular nerve preserved as well. So a lovely demonstration of everything all together going through the cochleo vestibular bone with the cochlear nerve here in the left ear going into the basal to into the uh, modiolus of the cochlea and the facial nerve in its labyrinthine segment and look at its intimate relationship to the cochlea. So lastly just to put it all together for you conceptually in your head we can see the left transpromatorial view of the facial nerve, the cartoon that Daniel has drawn, and this is ultimately the dissection I was left with in Singapore after I'd finished. We can see the facial nerve in the internal auditory canal through the labyrinthine segment up to the genicular ganglion just here, and then we can see the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Underneath the lateral semicircular canal, we've removed the stapedius muscle just here, and this is the descending mastoid segment of the facial nerve. So the TMJ anteriorly and the descending portion of the facial nerve posteriorly is the canal plasty that's required to get this sort of access for a transpromatorial view of the facial nerve. Now this was a lot to get through in just under an hour and I hope um, you found it useful, but just to understand that a systematic approach to the subunits of the middle ear ensures a thorough understanding for those of you that are trying to learn this anatomy. And remember that when we're doing surgery, it's really just removing pathology from named anatomical structures. And if you can do this with confidence, it'll really improve your surgical technique and your surgical confidence. So I hope you found this
relatively quick but thorough tour of the Middle East useful and please feel free to re-watch it again there's a, it's a very dense video and there's a lot of information in there and there's beautiful diagrams once again from Professor Marchioni and the work from Lucas and I can't do any of this without my other colleagues from the Sydney Endoscopic Ear Surgery Group uh, Alex Saxby, Nicholas Jufus and Jonathan Kong so thank you to my three good friends and colleagues uh, from the Sydney Endoscopic Ear Surgery Group and my other two colleagues who helped contribute a lot to this talk Thanks for watching everyone and we'll see you again soon.